Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's program, Reconstructing Environments of Our Ancient Ancestors, featuring biological anthropologist Amy Rector. My name is Brianna Pobiner, and I'm a paleoanthropologist and educator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. I'm a brown and gray-haired woman in an orange shirt in front of a Zoom screen with an African savanna photo with grass and an acacia tree behind me. Whether this is your first time joining us for our Hot Topics programs, or you've attended before, we're so glad to have you here. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. This discussion offers closed captioning. You can turn the captions on or off via the CC button, which should be located at the bottom of your Zoom interface. Um, we're in a webinar format, so we can't see or hear you. As you have questions, please go ahead and submit them to the Q&A box which is at the top or bottom of your screen. It looks like two speech bubbles. So we can sort through as many of your questions as possible. The Q&A time really flies by. The Q&A box is also where we'll share any relevant links during the program. So keep an eye out there. We'll start with an opening presentation by our speaker, Dr. Amy Rector, and then I'll join her here to take your questions. During the presentation, I will also write answers to some of your questions, at least any that I can answer, as well as will another member of our behind the scenes team, Dr. Ryan McRae. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Dr. Amy Rector is a biological anthropologist and an associate professor of anthropology at Virginia Commonwealth University. Her primary research includes reconstructing paleoecological contexts for early human evolution in Eastern and Southern Africa, as well as identifying and analyzing fossil animal, mammal communities particularly, to characterize their biogeographic and ecological affinities through space and time. Dr. Rector has conducted fieldwork in South Africa, Ethiopia, Zambia, and Morocco. She is also, congratulations, the newly elected vice president and program chair of the American Association of Biological Anthropologists, a conference which is taking place next week, a member of the Biological Anthropology Women's Mentoring Network, and she hosts a Mid-Atlantic Bioanthropology Interest Group annual meeting every fall at Virginia Commonwealth University. So now I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Richter. Thank you so much, Brianna. I'm so happy to be here with you all to tell you some stories today. Um, so let me get my slides up for you. And I wanted to let you know that I have brown hair and I am sitting in my office at school, which means that there's a whole crazy thing of plants and all kinds of anthropologically related things behind me. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you a short story about finding fossils and what we do with those fossils. So the work that I do and the teams that I work with, we primarily work in two places. And I'm gonna give you some information about where and how we look for fossils in those places. And then towards the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why we look for fossils in those places and what we do with those fossils once we find them. I do love questions. So please be putting questions in the Q&A so that we can all be answering. You are all probably at least a little familiar with a family tree that looks a little bit like this. This is the one from the Smithsonian Institution. And the representation of our ancestry as this branching tree with lots of different relatives. You are here up at the top, but we have lots of different cousins who have evolved over the last 7 million years and have different evolutionary fates and, and all kinds of interesting things that happen with them. Now for me and my teams, I'm interested in a very specific time period. This one right here. And I apologize if there's noise from outside my office. I'm interested in this time period right here between about three and two million years ago because they're the earliest members of our own genus, the genus Homo. There are members of other genuses like Australopithecus and Paranthropus. And so there are lots of potential ancestors of ours running around on two legs without giant brains yet, trying to figure out how changing environments and adaptations and, and really being bipedal and being a hominin, being an ancestor of ours is going to work. And so this time period, particularly, there's a lot going on and there's not that many places in the fossil record that you can find evidence of species that were alive here at this time. And so this is where I get to this where and how we're looking for fossils and then what we do with them and why at the end. Often when you think about 
our ancestors, you might think about reconstructions like this. What did they look like? You know, what did they have a lot of hair? Did they not have a lot of hair? What did it mean to be bipedal or walk on two legs for our ancestors three million years ago or six million years ago? How did it compare to what we look like today? And I am definitely interested in all of those things. I love these reconstructions. I love thinking about what our ancestors look like. But for me, as a paleoecologist, someone who reconstructs the environments where our ancestors lived, I want to look at the background of this, this particular reconstruction first. I want to know what the world looked like when our ancestors woke up three million years ago in the morning. When they opened their eyes, what did they see first? What did they hear? Who were they worried was going to eat them? Who did they have to compete for resources with? So what was the habitat like? What was the paleo environment like? And so when I go and I look for fossils, I am interested in the hominins and our ancestors. And I get excited and most of my stories today are actually about finding our ancestors themselves. But really what provides the information that I'm most interested in is everything else. What other mammals were on the landscape? What kind of antelopes were out there? Were the monkeys living in the trees or on the ground? And then what do all those things tell us about the paleo environment? You might also be familiar with a map of Africa that looks a little like this. This is showing us the East African Rift Valley system that runs just about all the way up and down the eastern border of Africa. And then there are some cave systems down here in southern Africa. And all of these yellow, little yellow dots are showing us where most of our hominin fossils and hominin ancestors have been found. Um, and so one of the places that, that my teams look for fossils are is up here in, in Eastern Africa. And one of the places where many fossils have been found this year is the 50th anniversary of the discovery of Lucy. Um, and so the site that I'm gonna talk about is actually right next door to that site. Uh, so a well-known area where fossils are. Something I wanna point out in this map though is a little bit of an open spot where maybe not as much exploration has been done or maybe not as many fossils have been found. And that's right here in Central Africa. So the stories I'm going to tell you today are about where we look for fossils, both in East Africa and in a new place in Central Africa, and how we do it in both of these places. So I'm going to start with the one where we've been established there for a long time. We kind of have it down to a science, as they say. And so here's this map of Africa again, and you can see the Rift Valley, even without it labeled in any way, you can see the lakes and the, and the bits of the valley that show that that big rifting system is active. And the site that I work at is in Ethiopia. And so it's all the way up towards the northern, northeastern part of Ethiopia in a lowland area called the Afar, the Afar Triangle that's pretty hot year round. And this is a panorama of what it looks like. We just got back from a field season a couple of weeks ago. And so this was from this particular field season. And our site is called the Lady Gararu Research Project. And like I said earlier, it's sort of nestled amongst a variety of other sites where lots of hominins have been found the last several decades. And we have actually worked at our site for a couple decades as well. Given that we've been working there for 20 years, we now have a pretty good hold on kind of the geological context and how old the fossils are that we find there. So we know that the Rift Valley is opening and we know that as you drop down into the Rift Valley, you kind of go back in time. So the fossils that you find deeper into the Rift Valley are older, but we don't always know where exactly the spot is that we wanna find say the 3 million year old fossils or the 2 million year old fossils. So at Lady Gararu, our geologists have been working for two decades now and we do actually know at Lady Gararu where we need to look. And so this is a geological map over here with a bunch of different colors that I'm not gonna tell you about, but I do want you to see these little squiggly lines. So there's a dark green squiggly line here, there's a blue squiggly line down here, and there's a yellow squiggly line here. Those are tufts. So what those are are volcanic layers that we can do really nice dating on. We can get absolute dates so we know how old those volcanic layers are. And thus, when we find fossils above or below those volcanic layers, we get a really good idea of how old those fossils are. So at this particular area in Lady Gararu, we have a tuff that's 2.59 million years old. We have a tuff that's 2.63 million years old. And we have a tuff that's 2.78 million years old. And they're all close enough together that if you stand on the right hill, you can see them all. 
What that means is we know exactly how old the fossils are that we are finding in these areas. And it's exciting because it's right between that three to two million year old time period where lots of cool things are happening. There's lots of species on the ground, um, all kinds of hominids. So what can we find here between three and two million years old? So this is where we're looking for the fossils and we're looking for them here. We know how old it is here. We know that there's a potential to find something from that exciting time period. How do we do it? We do it with a huge team of people to go out into the AFAR where there's not a lot of infrastructure and there's no running water and it's you know hot and all sorts of things. We need lots of team members. So we have our scientific team members who come from all over the world. Then we have some team members who take care of the camp. And then the local team members, we hire the AFAR people who, who are AFAR, um, they speak a language, AFRF, and, and they are the fossil finders because they live there and they can see them. So it takes a huge group like this. It takes a huge camp. We build, we have tents that we put up every year. This is one of our dining tents and our research tent. In the background, you can see our kitchen tent and one of our land cruisers. We also have our own tents because you're going to go out there, you're going to go for a while. So this past season we were out there was one of our shortest seasons yet. We were actually only on the ground for about two weeks. We usually try to be there, at least part of our team, for five weeks, six weeks to really make it worth the time to, to get everything set up and, and really get into searching for fossils. So you have to have your own tent too. And if you're lucky, you have a hammock. I remembered it this year and I keep forgetting it. We also, of course, have to set up camp in a way that we can actually live there, right? And so this is our long drop toilet. We have a couple of these. They're often positioned on the edge of the riverbank, which is usually empty at this time of year, so that you have a nice view out over the riverbank while you're using the long drop toilet. Um, but you always also have to make sure there's not some sort of uh, something that bites in there when you go in. So this last time I saw a huge scorpion when I walked in and I said, I guess I'm going to find someplace else not this long drop right now. People are often also interested in how we get cleaned up. And so we have these shower bags that we fill with water at the beginning of the day and you put them out in the sun and considering it's 100 degrees every day, you have a real nice hot bag of water at the end of the day. And so we then have these structures that are made of different things, different year, but you, you hang up your water bag and then you, you get decently clean at the end of each day. How we get our work done is we do have a huge generator um, that runs for certain hours in the evening. And so we can actually plug in computers and we have lights um, and the geologists always have all kinds of wild equipment that need to be charged up. Um, and so for those several hours, we have that electricity and we can get everything done that we need to get done. For the rest of the time, we try to keep that generator off because it's loud and it's disruptive. Um, and there, we're out here where people live, but also where animals live. So we wanna try to not get too disruptive in the environment. This is just a example of the jumble of cords from this past year with everybody trying to charge their phones, but also our data collection devices. So some of these iPhones are actually how we collect data, which I'll show you in a minute. And there's some GPS units down here. And like I said, this is all geology stuff over here. Um, all the fancy tech that we use to collect as much data about the fossils we are finding, where we are finding those fossils and other things that are relevant for how we interpret those fossils at the end of the day. You can't talk about being in the, in the field without mentioning the food. Uh, I'm a big proponent of your field camp and your field season is only going to be as successful as your food is. So we splash out with our kitchen crew and they splash out on us. And I eat better in the field than I eat anywhere else in the world. Um, and these are just two examples of, you know, the blended drinks that we sometimes got in the morning and also some amazing pizza. They, they dig holes in the ground and have an underground oven to bake bread every day and then bake pizza crust and cakes and all kinds of things. Fantastic. But of course, we're there for the fossils, right? So I start with what the camp looks like. Here's what it looks like where you're living. But every day, our goal is to get up and go out and find those fossils. The geologists are there, too, and they're trying to make sure they understand the geological contexts. Um, and they're around, but mostly it's the fossils. And so here is just an example of one of the places that we go to. Um, there may be a tiny little evidence of tuff over here in the corner to, and there's some just right here, these little white kind of streaks on the landscape are those volcanic tufts. So we know what age we're looking at when we're in a place like this. 
And if we've found fossils before, or if we, su we suspect that there may be fossils in an area like this, we walk in a straight line and make sure that we look at every single bit of the ground as we're moving so that we can find everything that might be out there. Sometimes we survey like this, other times we survey on hands and knees. Um, and then there are other times where we find things and we use kind of a different strategy. This, the walking and surveying is the one that we use the most. And so this is often the way that we find our fossils. So this is one of our colleagues, Omar Abdullah, um, and he is pointing to a tooth. We actually haven't published on this tooth yet. We're trying to get there. He's pointing to a tooth, but just as an example of a fossil that we have found during a survey like this, this is one of, well, this is the most famous fossil that comes from our site. Um, it was found in 2013 and it was published in 2015, I think. Um, and it is a 2.78 million year old half of a mandible, so half of a jaw, that does come from the earliest member of our genus, the genus Homo. So there's not a whole lot more to it. We don't know too much more about what this species looks like. We just have this one, you know, half of a mandible, half of a jaw to, to tentatively give us this clue that here is the origin of our own genus. And it has to do with the size and the shape and the teeth, and the size and the shape of the, of the jaw itself. But this tells us we need to keep looking, that there could be more things out there, more, more members of this species of this species or even other species that can tell us what's happening during this exciting time where the first members of our genus are evolving. So this past year, we knew there was a spot where we had found some things in the past. And so we decided for those two weeks that we were on the ground in January and February, we were going to focus very specifically on one particular site. And we didn't do a whole lot of surveying because we knew the area that we wanted to be in. Instead, we chose to look for fossils in this manner, which is called screening or sieving. And we're literally taking buckets of earth where we think these fossils might be, and we are screening them so that we can get the little tiny chunks and find the little tiny chunks. Um, we wouldn't just randomly screen in an area. We find an area where other fossils have been found. So it looks like a productive area. We first survey and make sure we've looked at every inch of the ground, and then we can go in and do something like this once we know we've picked up everything off the surface. There were multiple days of screening where not a whole lot was found. So we sang a lot of songs and got through the days. But then there were also some days where we did find some things. Um, so it was very exciting because this particular site is also 2.78 million years. It's the same horizon or the same time frame as that, that half of a jaw from, from early Homo that we found before. Um, so this is just my little teaser here where I'm pointing at a piece of a tooth that we found from there. So we're pretty excited about that. And this is us showing our colleague, Bada O Mohammed. He is one of the AFAR who's worked with us for many, many years. He happened to not be there that day. So as soon as he got back, we showed him and he was pretty excited to share in that discovery. And so our AFAR colleagues are co-authors on our papers, um, the one we have submitted now and uh, moving forward because they are critical to us finding these species or these fossils most of the time. So just as kind of a pullback a little bit, we looked for fossils through survey, we looked through fossils for screening, and then we also need to make sure we're collecting all of the data necessary. So those were hominin stories, but most of the time we're finding mammals, and that's what I wanna find, because I wanna see the antelopes and the monkeys and everything else that might tell us a little bit about the environment. So here's just some examples of the way we take pictures and collect data so that we can have really nice maps of where we're finding these fossils. We know how old they are, we know how they relate to each other. Every day at the end of the day, all the fossils that we collect with their barcode numbers and all of the information that we put in a database right out in the field using one of these iPhones. So we take photos and, and enter them into the database immediately. And then we come back to camp and we get them cleaned up. Sometimes we label them, we put them in pretty little bags so that at the end of each season, all the fossils we find go back with us to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, where they stay stored in either a vault if they are hominins, so if they are our ancestors, or in another storage area if they are not hominins. So I was looking for a picture of the vault, and this is the one that I found. These are two of my colleagues, and they're looking at that mandible, the LD350, that early homo mandible from years ago. But back here in the background, what you can see are these big bank vaults. 
And every single hominin or every single ancestor of ours that's been discovered in Ethiopia, no matter what the project or where it's been found, is placed in one of these vaults for safekeeping. And so then your project has a vault and you can get keys to your particular project. I don't spend a lot of time in this room because I don't study these guys. I spend the time in the other room where the other fossils are. And I'll come to that in a minute. The second half of my where and how story is from Central Africa here. And this is a shorter story because it's a new project, but I first wanna say where we're looking and how. And so Central Africa, I'm actually gonna go back to this one for just a second. Central Africa, you can see that there is one fossil site here um, in Malawi, but there's just not a whole lot going on around here. And it's not because well, I don't think it's because there, there are no fossils to find. I think it's we haven't quite been looking in the right places. And so if we zoom in on Zambia, and so you can see the outline of Zambia here, there is a famous fossil from Zambia called the Kabwe skull. It was found in a cave and a mine uh, a long time ago. But that's really one of the only hominin fossils that's been identified. Here's another map of Zambia with some of the national parks. And this is important because Zambia has a lot of natural resources that are relevant to our study of, of human origin. So there are habitats in Zambia that we think are very similar to where our ancestors evolved. In one of these places, in one of these habitats where we think our ancestors evolved, a riverine habitat or a um, forest that's, that's associated with a river, there was a team in the 20s, early 2010s that did some exploration and found some fossils of a monkey that they identified to a species that was alive between about, sorry, I, I can't see it. There we go, 3.3 to 2.4 million years ago. And so right there, that's the ding, 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 that's the time period we want, three to two million years ago. Maybe we should go look here. That team decided they weren't gonna be looking anymore. And so a colleague of mine and I, we decided, you know what? There's not a whole lot from Central Africa. That's the magic time period where the earliest member of our genus and some other species are alive. Let's go look, let's go do this. And so we did. Uh, my colleague, Thiera and I from uh, Western University of Health Sciences, we put together a project that we call the Zambia Rift Valley Research Project. And we went and we looked for fossils. But most importantly, from my perspective, as an ecologist, a paleoecologist, we didn't just look for fossils, we thought about that modern habitat, and we think about that modern habitat. Because this riverine forest here, so you can see this huge undammed river, it's one of the last major undammed rivers in Africa, it still floods during the rainy season and gets really low during the dry seasons. That type of river with its associated forests, we think is maybe, a place where our ancestors would have liked. And so our hominin ancestors might have evolved in a habitat that looks like this. So this is an important place to study for the animals that live here today too. So part of our project includes looking for living animals. It includes taphonomy transects, which is looking for the bones of the animals that are on the ground right now, looking for fossils, of course, but we also really care about education, science, communication, and training. So we've only actually been on the ground for one full season. And in that full season, we spent the entire time at South Luangwa National Park. This is a national park that's centered on that Luangwa River. And so there is the seasonal river that goes up and down and a really rich mammalian community. And during that season, we did live animal census, which literally means we drove around and took down information about the animals that we saw, where they were, what the temperature was, who were they, how many were there, so that we could get an idea of what the living population on the ground in an environment like this looks like. What is that mammalian community like living there today? Uh, it's cool. There's some lions, there's some leopards. You see them all the time. If you wanna see these types of animals, you should go to South Alonga National Park. But we didn't just look for the animals that are alive, we also looked for the remains of animals that had been alive. And so we did what are called taphonomy transects, which is walking and looking for bones on the ground and then recording data about the bones you find on the ground. Dr. Pobiner is a expert in this. So if you have questions about this, she's really the one you should be asking because I've learned a lot about what I know from her work. 
And so as we were walking in the park, you see lots of dead things and lots of lots of remains of dead things um, with lots of information you can collect and then compare who's alive today, but then what signal do we find on the ground based on the skeletons that we find? Here's an example of one of our teams doing a transect that's very similar to the fossil survey, walking across the ground, collecting data about the bones that we find. We did this in multiple different habitats so that we could decide or we could test, are there differences in the bones that we find close to the river versus far away from the river? Are there differences in the signals that we find in the floodplains versus the grasslands? And then at the end of the day, what does that pattern of bones on the ground, how can we learn from that to interpret a potential fossil record? What are the fossils we find? Is the pattern similar to what we find on the ground from the living community? So we're trying to put multiple pieces of information together to characterize both the living community and the community we would expect to find in the fossil record. Speaking of fossils, we did look for fossils. We found quite a few fossils. Um, and it was pretty exciting. So some of the some of the exciting part of working in South Luangwa is the fact that there are animals out there. So here's a picture of my foot next to an elephant footprint. So we do have to have armed guards with us because you're just right out there with all those animals. Up here in the left hand corner, these are some fossils that have been found by other team members. This is our team from this summer. It's an Earthwatch group, which I'll tell you about in just a second. We are flagging more than just fossils. This ended up being an archeological assemblage, but we did find fossils out on these exposed beaches. This is actually the first one we found, which I love deeply because it's an antelope toe. So it's my favorite. In terms of education and science communication and training, there are groups we work with on the ground in South Luangwa who train children and other groups in conservation efforts. But part of what we do is we work with Earthwatch Institute, which is a group where you can actually join scientific projects as a volunteer and be a part of that scientific data collection. And so we had a whole team of people with us this summer. We're going to do it again in 2025, not in 2024, but we're going to do it again in 2025. So you can come with us. You can come with us and look for and collect data about living animals, about skeletons, and about fossils. Tons of fun and you should consider it. I think they're going to drop the, the link in the chat. But to rewind back to that main question of why and how we use the fossils, recall that I am a paleoecologist. And so what I want to know about is what the world looked like when our ancestors woke up. So it's great to know that they're this ancestor or this ancestor or this one. I'm glad about that. But I really want to know what else was around and what were their worlds like? And so what I do is, yes, I look for the hominin fossils, so these might be the skulls of our ancestors, but as I said earlier, I like to find the antelopes or the rhinos or the hippos or the monkeys and learn what I can learn about them and their paleoenvironmental needs, their ecological needs, to put the whole story together in a community to say the habitat had to look like this in order to support monkeys that were in the trees and these other animals that were on the ground eating grass, it had to look something like this. So I can do that both from a major community perspective, who was out there, but I can also do it in a little bit more detailed way. And so I have one last story to tell you about monkeys. And these are the bones of monkeys that have been found at some of the sites in Eastern Africa in the Afar um, from several million years ago. And so these are all bones that make up the arms of monkeys. And what I did with these is I, I took a lot of data and I collected a lot of 3D digital data with this point digitizer, both on living, not, not alive ones, both on the skeletons of living ones and on these fossil ones to compare. What did they look like? Were they moving the same way? as living monkeys or were they moving in different ways? And ultimately that's a question of, were they in the trees or were they on the ground? And what does that mean about the habitat 3 million years ago when these monkeys were alive? And so what I found from that particular study of these fossil monkeys is that through time in the Afar 3 million years ago, it looks like the monkeys first spent a lot of time in the trees. And then as it got younger and time passed, they spent more and more time on the ground. And so what that means for us from a paleoecological perspective is 
at the earlier time periods, there were lots of forests and trees for monkeys to live in. But later on, things got drier and the habitat changed. So if we want to then think about our own ancestors, we can say, well, our earlier ancestors like Australopithecus, they lived in an environment with these trees. They might've been competing with those monkeys for food. But later on, when our earliest member of our genus, the genus Homo, when it evolved, it was much drier. So there was something different about the habitat. Was a drier, more seasonal habitat important for the evolution of our own genus? It could be, but you can't answer those questions unless you have the fossils of the mammalian community to study and see what kind of environment and paleo habitats there had to be there to support everybody. And so we do think there might have been a habitat that looked a little bit like this as it dried up, that there were lots of resources out there, that first there were lots of trees and then it got much drier and much more seasonal, but that our ancestors, the earliest member of the genus Homo, they might have woken up in the morning and seen something like this. And that to me is pretty exciting. So thank you very much for listening to my stories and I am looking forward to some questions. Awesome, that was wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed all those different stories. And of course, um, doing similar research, it was really delightful to hear a little bit more insight into your project and to get um, a little glimpse behind the scenes of sort of what camp life is like doing field work. Yeah. Um, okay, we already have questions coming in. So I will ask, uh, the first question is from Tad, and he says, Dr. Rector showed a few different maps of Africa. One thing though that I don't recall ever seeing is a map of Africa, let's say six million years ago, or two to three million years ago, which is her focus, or two to 300,000 years ago when Homo sapiens emerged. I presume the geography of the continent and even its basic outline or shoreline was very different. That is a fantastic question. And now I'm envisioning a very cool map. Um, and I'm not totally sure what would be on it. But even over the last 6 million years, the outline of Africa is probably pretty similar. So mm -hmm. as, as um, what are they, continents, you know, moved around over millions and millions of years, there's a bit much sort of deeper scale for, for major continental movements. So I would say the outline of Africa is probably pretty similar over the last 6 million years, but you are correct about things like the, the Rift Valley would have been in a different size and shape. Um, we think in fact that the rifting movements and the changing rivers and lakes associated with those valleys as they were opening up, that those probably had deep impacts on the hominins that were evolving there and the communities that were living there. Um, so I actually think that's a really great idea to have some maps to kind of show, especially the movements of the rifts, there might be something like that out there, but especially the movements of the rifts and how um, the water sources, especially, and sort of highlands versus lowlands altitude would have impacted the species on the, on the, on the landscape. It's a great question. Excellent. Um, I'm going to bounce to one of our behind the scenes team's questions, because um, we have a couple questions for you as well. So this is a sort of, um, camp life question. So in your perspective, what's the most difficult aspect of living and working in such a remote place? And what's the most rewarding or enjoyable aspect of that? Those are great questions. So <laughs> the, I have answers that kind of hit both, but um, not too long ago, when you went out to the AFR, you were really out away. Um, and so when I first went to Hadar, I worked in Hadar in 2001, and we had three minutes a week on a satellite phone. And that was it. That was the only contact you had with the outside world. I was there for two and a half months. And the first minute and a half of your three minute call would be waiting for like the delay for the ringing. And so it was, it was really feeling like you were disconnected. Now we all have Ethiopian cell phones and you can call and you can email. And so you're still connected to everything. So on one hand, that's great. And on the other hand, I would kind of like to be able to check out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, one of the hardest parts is um, just, I would say the heat really, it gets really hot and it, it stays hot at night. And so that can be difficult to sleep sometimes. 
And so that kind of disruption, like you really have to work on making sure that your hydration is balanced and, and you got to concentrate on drinking. And, um, and so that can be pretty hard, but generally speaking, the whole thing is really rewarding. Um, camp life is so great because you're all experiencing the same thing at the same time. The entire crew is there. So the crew who takes care of the kitchen and, and all of the camp is there as well as the AFR stay with us. That's not how it works on every single project, but the AFR that we hire do live with us. So we all have breakfast together. We all have lunch together. We all have dinner together. And then in the evenings, we're all hanging out talking under the stars. Um, and it's just the best. It's one of the best parts about field work. And that's one of the reasons I talk about the camp so much is because it's just fantastic. And I want people to know. I love that. That's awesome. Um, here's another sort of related question in a sense. Um, so Noah asks, what's the longest a field research trip can possibly last? I think potentially, I was going to say the sky's the limit, but really your budget's the limit, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that in the AFR especially, it does get too hot. There are periods during the summer where it's just untenable. You cannot be out there during the day looking for fossils. So it couldn't be year round in the AFR, um, but I do know that people go for several months. The longest I was there was about two and a half months. Um, so two to three months, I think is probably on the longer end of some seasons, mm -hmm. but that might be different in different places. In South Africa, where I've worked, we the cave was you know a drive away from a major town, like a 10 minute drive. So we just lived in a house and theoretically your season could go all year round because it didn't really get too hot or too cold. It was a little nasty in the winter, but it was doable. Um, so you could do it all year. And so that is really where the budget is the limit. There's also a rainy season that we have to worry about. I was about. just going to ask that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Whether yeah. a rainy season would interrupt your work. Yeah, absolutely. So there's rainy season in Ethiopia, but the rainy season in Zambia is truly disruptive because mm. they call it the emerald season. That's it rains so much and the river comes so high that a lot of the people who live there just kind of have to buckle down and be muddied in. Like you just can't get out sometimes. So wow. it would be impossible and we would not be find any bones or anything on the ground during that time period at all. Yeah. Speaking of finding things on the ground, Kylie asks, what's the most common fossil to find? Ooh, well, the most common fossils are my favorites. <laughs> um, usually it's an antelope of some kind. Um, mm -hmm. Teeth in general, I would say, are some of the most common because teeth are dense and they fossilize really well. So we find lots and lots of teeth of just about everything, as long as it's over kind of a certain size. Um, but we find lots of antelope teeth. We also find lots of the insides of antelope horns called horn cores. They are also pretty dense and they fossilize really well. And then I would say maybe in reality, chunks of something that you can't identify. So some chunk of some long bone that could be anything and we don't have enough of it to know what it is, but there is evidence of fossils on the ground. But I am lucky that I love antelopes because we really do find a lot of antelopes. Nice. Um, so here's a question from Niels who, who says or asks, early human fossils have mostly been found in very dry places because that's where they preserve well. And mm -hmm. I would probably say very dry places today. Now, is yeah. there any reason to believe that our ancestors were adapted to live in dry lands or did they live in all types of environments? That is a great question. And that is one of the major questions that I try to address with my research is, you know, could a species live in lots of different habitats or were they really tied to one? Mm -hmm. And so I agree with, with Brianna here that today, a lot of the places we find them are dry, but when they were living there, they were probably much wetter. There was a lot of resources. And one of the reasons they fossilized there in the first place likely had to do with maybe dying in the mud or dying in a relatively sort of sticky spot where their bones would settle and be protected and then they could fossilize there really easily. Um, so the habitats in Eastern Africa today are pretty different in a lot of cases from where what we think they look like when the hominins themselves were there. That being said, we are finding evidence that like, like the earliest homo and a few other species that seasonality and a little bit more dryness may have been important to the evolution of some of these species. So not that they were really living anywhere all that dry, but that they could handle shifts in the environment and shifts in the season in a way that their earlier ancestors might not have had to. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm, ex I'm interested and excited about that too, this idea that we can, we can identify some seasonality in a lot of different ways and how that might've been important as a trigger for evolution too. Yeah. Um, I'm going to shift to another behind the scenes theme okay. question. Um, and so you talked a lot about that um, partial mandible attributed to early homo. Mm -hmm. And so we're wondering what makes it more like homo than Australopithecus or any other option and why it's just called early homo and not one of the species. Why hasn't it been given a species designation? Those are two fantastic questions. Um, the first one is um, I actually have a whole slide that shows some of these things, but it, it has to do with the dimensions of the teeth and the dimensions of the jaw itself. Um, so folks who study hominin teeth, like the details that they know and the patterns that they have identified are pretty amazing. But things like the width versus the length of the teeth is more like homo than an earlier ancestor. Mm -hmm. Things like mm -hmm. the fact that the molars, there's three molars in the row in a row, and the first molar is the biggest, and then they get smaller mm -hmm. towards the back, and Australopithecus is the other way. Um, there's also a foramen or a hole that has, I honestly do not know the details on it, but it's pointing in a direction that is more like Homo than Australopithecus. <laughs> so it really is the size and the shape of these details. Um, very detailed little pieces of morphology that you might only know if you had really seen a lot of Australopithecus and early Homo um, mandibles and teeth. Now, why is it not put in a designated to a species is for one, there aren't any species from that time period that we could necessarily drop it into. And so there's sort of a, this is the only one from that time. And, and it doesn't look exactly like everything else. So if we were to choose another species that already has been named it's mm -hmm. difficult to go back from that <laughs> yeah um, mm -hmm. but also if we were to name a new species it's difficult to go back from that too yeah. so so it we're almost it's almost like we're in a waiting game right now let's find some mm -hmm. more so that we can find more of the same species and we can really tell is it the same as something we already know or is it really truly obviously something different so it needs a new mm -hmm. species for now, this is sort of the conservative way of saying yeah. we know it's different, but we're just not ready to put a name on it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just yeah. going to say it does sound like a conservative way to yeah. approach that sort of taxonomy and naming. Cool. Yeah, which can um, get really complicated really fast. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so um, Shiler asks, when you find animal fossils, does it ever indicate that our ancestors had consumed them or even hunted them? Does your work inform how we understand early human diets? Brianna, shall I pass that to you? Would you like <laughs> no, to no, answer no. that? No, I appreciate that. But even, you know, from the perspective of just generally these sorts of research questions in the types of work that you do. Um, so yes. So right about this time period, we do have some stone tools from a different area, not the area that I was showing you on that one map, but from a different area of our site that is that are 2.6 million, a little bit older than that. Um, and so we do find stone tools around for one, that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but we do find stone tools, but we have found some cut mark bones occasionally. And so that does mean that, um, you know, tools were at least used to cut these bones for whatever purpose they're using. Um, those are not very common at our site. We don't find too many of them, but, you know, in all honesty, it's possible we're not looking for them as hard as we should be, you know, like that's something that we hasn't necessarily been at the forefront of what we're thinking about. Um, but we have been looking for them and they're just, there's not that many on the landscape. And the reason I was going to defer to Brianna is that is exactly her area of research. She, that is, she is the world's expert in that. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate that. It is it's definitely a, a big um, focus of my research is looking for those cut marks on fossils. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the smoking guns that tell us that those animals were eaten by our ancestors. So, yeah. yeah. Um, here's another cool question from Kylie who asks, when big fossils are found, how are they preserved for museums to display and how are they transported? That is a great question. Oh man. Oh, that's a good one. So unfortunately, the biggest ones we have to leave in the field. So if we collected every elephant and hippo fossil that we found, we would need 800 museums in Addis Ababa to fit them all. So there's just not enough space for all of them. Um, back when people started working in Ethiopia in the 70s, you know, they were collecting some of those things. So we do have some good examples of those. 
um, mm -hmm. that are in the museum. But now what we do is we collect data, we take an observation rather than the fossil itself. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, if there is something special about that fossil, like there are cut marks on it, um, we do jacket them just like you see maybe in videos of people who study dinosaurs. We'll jacket them with plaster and take them out of the ground in a big kind of bundle, looks like a little baby bundle, um, to take back so that we can take good care of it that way. Um, all of our fossils actually have to be transported, especially the hominins specifically, they cannot get on an airplane, so they have to be transported by vehicle from the field. Uh, so one of the things I got to do this year, um, just as a side note, because hominins can't go on airplanes, I got to drive with the fossils uh, back to Addis Ababa. Um, and so we have big land cruisers and theoretically you could put, you know, you could fill a land cruiser with an elephant skeleton, which I think we have done before. Um, but generally we don't because there's just not enough space. Um, mm. So yeah, it's always disappointing to come across a really cool hippo and be like, can't take you home, but let me take a picture. So why can you not put a hominin on a plane? I think it's just an added level of risk that seems unnecessary, right? Um, okay. You know, and so for our site, it's only about an eight hour drive, seven hour drive these days because the, the, the road's nice. Um, and we're one of the further north ones. So the middle Awash and everybody else, they're actually closer to Addis and they just drive anyway. I don't think they fly anyway. Um, okay. But yeah, so they to protect them, they they have to be with one of the permit holders and they have to drive back to Addis mm -hmm. to be to put in the museum. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so this is one of our behind the scenes teams questions also. You showed a couple of pictures where you mentioned some tufts. How do you know which tuff is which? Oh my God, also a great question. Our geologists, I mean, it's amazing what they can do. And so for one, one of the easier ways, one of the ways that I can do it is sometimes the tufts are different colors. So some of them are very, very white. Um, we have one that's called the golden sands because it's got some golden sands in it. So I can tell that one, it's a little bit colder. Um, there's another one that sits right on top of some green layers, so I can tell that one by the color as well. Um, the geologists themselves, they do the analyses to show, they can, they can show that, you know, a tuff that we find 30 miles that way versus one that we find 30 miles that way, they have the same glass signatures in them from the eruptions, so they don't mm -hmm. actually have to look at the colors. They can analyze and see that it is, it is the exact same eruption event based on the composition of the tuff itself. So that's why I said specifically, we've been here for 20 years, the geologists have been yeah. working on it for 20 years, so we've had time to do a lot of that stuff. It mm -hmm. takes a long time to do those types of analyses. Um, and so you start out with what color is it and what, 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 what word am I looking for? Um, the texture or the grain texture, size? Or yeah, the, yeah, what's the texture mm -hmm. and yeah. the grain size, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but I'm not I'm not so good like I can tell the colors yeah. on some of them, but others are like, can someone remind me which one this is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Bill asked, can you discuss how your projects are funded. Great question. So on the first slide I had several of our funding agencies. Um, Lady Guerrero has been funded by the National Science Foundation for various years. Um, we have another grant proposal in right now to the National Science Foundation that we are crossing our fingers about. Um, we also have some infrastructure for Lady Guerrero through the Institute of Human Origins, which is a research center at Arizona State University. And by infrastructure, I mean the vehicles are owned by IHO. So we don't have to rent vehicles. We don't have to buy vehicles. The only thing we need in our budget is to maintain them and pay for gas, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we recently got a leaky grant to, to do some of this work as well. And so that, that's, I think, our first leaky foundation grant for this particular project. Um, and then for Zambia, we have had a couple small grants, but the Earthwatch grant is an interesting mechanism. And mm -hmm. so it's not a grant in the sense that they hand you a bunch of money to do your work, but it is a grant in the sense that they give you teams of people to help you do the work. And that is so fun. I was a little bit nervous about it, but it's so fun because we had four different teams of really interested citizen scientists who wanted to be there, wanted to learn to look for fossils, wanted to be looking for bones, just had the best time and really were our eyes on the ground. We could not have done it without them. Um, and so that's why we're gonna do it again with Earthwatch in 2025, because um, we just had a great time and we collected so much data. And so it's great. 
But awesome. the, the real answer to that is also you're always, always yeah. writing grants to get money to do the research. And some years you don't get any and you just have to, you know, write some papers and do the other things in the meantime uh, mm -hmm. so that you can, you can write another grant. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. I'm going to bounce back to our behind the scenes teams question. Okay. So um, is there any way to test the plausibility of resource competition between hominins and other primates in the AFR, which you mentioned, and how might you even approach that question? Oh, I like that. Um, I will say, honestly, as paleoanthropologists, we like to find patterns and then we like to interpret a lot of things from those patterns. And so sometimes we could use more data than we actually have or can get. Um, but the way I started thinking about that was through a through kind of a model of locomotion. So how are these creatures moving and how big are their bodies? Um, so afarensis, for instance, is bigger than most of these primates, except for the big primates that are on the ground. So there's a period of time mm -hmm. where afarensis is on the ground with a four legged monkey that is almost as big as they are. Um, and so that was my first kind of exploration into they are sharing the ground and they are sharing the resources mm. on the ground and their body sizes are similar. More recently, uh, some colleagues have, have helped me get a little bit more into, and I haven't done it with the monkeys, I have colleagues who do this with the monkeys, get into looking at actual isotopic signatures of what they're eating. And so I would combine information like that. Does it look isotopically like they're eating very, very similar things? And if they are also on the ground and they are also both large bodied, you know, then I think you can start really thinking about how are they making that work on a day to day kind of, you know, <laughs> basis, right? So how, what does that competition look like and how are they dividing up their niche space? And then usually it's, you know, they're not the only ones trying to eat those particular resources. There are other animals in the environment doing it too. Um, so those are the fun things I think to think about, yeah. I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about like that, that you mentioned an isotopic signature, like mm -hmm. what is that kind of analysis and how does that work? So it's really fun to collect isotopic or to collect dental samples for isotopes. So mm -hmm. just to start with what you actually do is you find mm -hmm. a tooth and I'm looking around as if I have it on my desk. I don't. <laughs> um, some people use Dremel tools with little tiny, you know, the little tiny whirly drill bit tips basically or drill tips. Um, our team uses Manny Petty kits, which are really easy to control. <laughs> and so we have, and mine's purple, which I really like. I have purple Manny Petty kit, and you just, you drill the tiniest bit of enamel off of a tooth. You don't need very much, but you need to try to make sure that you're just getting the enamel itself. So you have to be careful about where you're sampling. Mm -hmm. And then that tiny sample gets sent to a lab where they basically analyze it for ratios that are related to the amount of carbon and the amount of oxygen, and there can be other ones, but those ratios of carbon and oxygen will give you some information about were animals eating a certain type of plant or were they drinking a lot of water? Did they have access to water? Did they not have access to water? And so you can get information like this antelope tended to be eating a lot of grass in dry habitats. So you can get that from an isotopic signature. Um, of carbon and oxygen. There are others, they're doing some nitrogen work now that I think, or they have been for a while, but that can give you a little bit of information about meat eating. Um, so it's actually, you know, there are these different levels of data, but when you take isotopes from a tooth, you're actually getting a chemical signal of what that animal consumed during their lives. Um, mm -hmm. And then you might use it and also add information like, what kind of wear pattern? So what did it look like with wearing down their teeth? What does that tell you about their diet? What were the shapes mm -hmm. of their teeth? What does that tell you about their diet? So there's lots of bits of information you can put together. Um, before, I think I'm gonna probably go to our last question in a moment, but I just wanted to share a comment from Brian who said, I also appreciate your stories from the field. I'm an Egyptologist and have wonderful memories from my time on digs. Fantastic. So, oh, I'm jealous that you. you've been on digs in, in Egypt. That's cool. <laughs> Um, okay, so this will probably be our last question. Okay. Um, and other than giving us clues about the environment, what else can the fossils of primates, antelopes, and other animals tell us about our hominin ancestors? That's a great question. And I think they can tell you a ton of stuff. For one, from kind of a, a big picture standpoint, I showed you a family tree of our ancestors and it looked, there's a lot of branches. There's a lot of animal or species at the same time evolving in different ways. There's a 
adaptive radiations multiple different times. If you see something similar happening in other groups, that also gives you information about kind of, you know, everything like resources on the ground, environmental context. Again, if monkeys are also radiating in that way, and there's lots and lots of species who are competing, um, you're seeing something really neat about the entire community there. So I think that gives you a little bit of context. It also might might give you context with, for example, um, we find some mammals in places in Africa and we never find them in other places. So for instance, we're looking for hominins, we wanna find hominins. Why do we not find them in some places? And if there are other species, like there's bears in Africa until about 4 million years ago, why do we find bears some places and not others? So you can use some of the animals on the ground and the community on the ground as a model in some ways for where you should expect to find things or maybe why there's some barriers to movements. Like why can some animals go some places and others can't? Um, is there something keeping hominins from, from being found in this area? And we might get clues from the other animals who either are or not found there. So that's big questions of biogeography, I think can be, can be really interesting too. That's awesome. I think we'll, we'll end with those, you know, big questions sorts of things. Um, so we're going to wrap up today's virtual program. Please join me in thanking Dr. Rector for sharing her work with us. Um, I also like to give special thanks to those who made this program possible. Um, that includes our behind the scenes team who helped sort through your questions, including Dr. Ryan McRae, um, who works with us in the Human Origins Program, to our donors, volunteers, and viewers like you. And finally, to all our partners who help us reach, educate, and empower millions of people around the world today and every day. We thank you. This is our second to last Hot Topic program for the spring. Our next one will be a special program for DNA Day on April 25th. So stay tuned. We don't have the registration link up for that uh, program yet, but we hope to soon. Um, we've also put a link in the Q&A where you can find information about our upcoming programs and how to sign up for the museum's weekly e-newsletter. That newsletter is really the best way to stay informed about our upcoming programs and learn more about the museum's research and exhibits. After this webinar ends, you'll see a survey pop up asking for some feedback about the program. Please take a moment to respond. We're very curious to know what topics you might be interested in seeing for future programs, and we appreciate your input. Again, thank you to our participants, to Dr. Rector, um, and to you, the audience. See you thank you time. so much.